Let's stand and give God praise. I don't. Yeah. Happy Wednesday. Go ahead, sit down. Happy middle of the week. Happy Wednesday. What? Um, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Anybody here for the very first time? Raise your hand if you're here for the first time for church. Don't be shy. Let's see. Oh, there's a couple of guys being shy. I know a few of you guys are here, but we're glad you're here. What's one of the first things that they talk about when you come in the one-year program you're going to have to acquire when you're going to get into recovery, right? And sobriety is patience right? So tonight we need your patience because we're going to try something new, all right? So one of the things that, if you want to go ahead and throw that up on the screen right there, one of the things is the connect card, right? We put those on the chairs a couple They're still there. If you haven't filled one out or if you have some other feedback or some prayer requests, some questions, keep filling them out and drop them in. You're going to see we're going to do the offering a little different. That's why these are, you think these guys are my security guards, don't you? That's what they are. Yeah, nah, they're not. They're not. We're going to do our offering instead of coming forward. We're going to do it this way. So make sure you fill out those connect cards for us. All right. The other thing is, is that we are changing our offering up a little bit. Instead of coming forward, we're going to collect it at the beginning of service and we'll change it around a little bit and see what works the best but right now, this is how we're going to do it. And I know not everybody uh, comes with cash or check, and you like to give online. So during the offering, we're going to leave that QR code up there. It's in the back on the TV screen right there, too. And if you want to give online with your phone, you can just take a picture of that QR code. All right? So as the ushers are taking the offering, they'll come upstairs, too. Let's do the birthdays. All right? We're still going to do birthdays on Wednesdays. So this week... Who had a birthday? I want you to stand up if you got a birthday this week. Let's see who's got a birthday. 
Come on, stand up. All right, there. I like that. Who, uh, no, uh, no, nobody on the women's side. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I saw that stuff. Happy birthday. And no kids tonight. No kids. Where's it? Are they coming down? Oh, there we go. All right. She's coming. You know what's funny is the older you get, the slower you walk. The little kids come running. They just run up here like, yeah, let's go. Happy birthday. You're welcome. How old are you? Twelve. Twelve. And look what you're wearing. Pull your shirt tight. Look at that. She's wearing the tiger stuff tonight, right? You know they lost today, right? They lost. Nah, that's all right. It happens. All right. How about we sing happy birthday to these guys and this young lady? All right. Let's sing happy birthday. What are you going to do with your birthday money? Tell me. Yeah. What are you going to do? Um, I'm going to give some to the church. Yeah, some to the church. We love that. We love that. And then what are you going to do with the rest? Um, I don't know. I don't know either. Share it with your sister. Donate to the Lions. No. She says, no. 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 All right. All right. Go ahead. You can go sit back down. Thanks for your patience. That, that went pretty smooth, right? And we're going we're gonna to modify that a little bit, but just be ready for that in the future. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to take the offering this way, and, uh, and we'll work on perfecting it a little bit. For, so thanks for your patience. And remember, too, we'll always have the QR code up during the offering, too, if that's how you choose to give. All right, so now we're going to listen to our praise team. We won't have to come forward. We can just stand and listen to our praise team and enjoy them and have a great rest of the week.
city. You're the king of his people. You're the Lord of this nation. You're the peace to the restless. You are.
climb the mountain Some days I touch the clouds Some days my best friend has been the cold hard ground But there's mercy new each morning Comfort through the night My eyes are fixed on Jesus And I'm gonna be alright I got that hallelujah Feeling down in my soul sun won't shine there's a reason for the struggle and a season for the pride but my hope is never fading because it's anchored in the truth my father goes before me and he don't see me through i got that hallelujah feeling down in my soul You guys can have a seat. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Yes. Thought you guys were about to do another one there for a minute. All right, so last week we talked a little bit about, uh, what did we talk about? Community, church community. Uh, and I kind of want to continue on that, that, uh, what's that? That's right. Gangsters. That's right. That is part of what, yeah. You don't, you don't go to gang. You're part of a gang. That's actually part. I kind of want to keep talking about that. That's good that you, you were able to remember that. Most people can't, uh, there's actually been studies out there that show that, uh, you can preach the greatest message. You think you delivered this incredible message, and if you actually uh, survey people uh, what, uh, what the pastor said on Sunday morning, you ask people Sunday night what he said, like 90% of everything he said they can't remember. By Monday morning, the only thing they can remember is, is some story you told, and by Tuesday, it's just completely out, out the window. So for you to know that on Wednesday, that must have been, that must have really hit your heart. I'm a gangster. All right. Uh, that'll stick. That'll stick. That'll preach. So let's talk about the church a little bit. Let's pray first. Let's do that. Father God, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for your grace. God, thank you for the hallelujah you have put in our hearts, God, because of your great 
uh, marvelous grace and love for us. Um, even when we were lost, God, uh, you came to us and uh, born us again to a living hope and to a family, to be part of something, to belong to something uh, that is bigger than ourselves, God. And I pray that you continue to reveal that vision to us in a way, God, that uh, you show up and you're glorified and others come to know you and um, are freed from the bondage of sin and um, shame and, and all that uh, life brings with it, God. We pray that you would be here, you'd speak to us, and that you would be glorified. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So people have different views of the church, right? Sometimes they have very negative views, uh, positive views, and a lot of that has to do with an idea of how you actually relate to the church. And how you relate to it has to do with what you think it should be or what um, you, your experience with it previously. Uh, but if you don't really know what a church is supposed to be, then you're probably going to have a wrong way of relating to it. So like if you, and I'll break that down for you a little bit, but when you look at what the church is throughout Scripture, one of the, the, my favorite ways of kind of breaking this down is to look at all of the different ways of, of these images and pictures that God gives us in the, in the Scripture to tell us what, what the uh, church is supposed to be. And what I mean by church is that gang, right? Not the building, like the architecture and all these other things. I'm talking about the people, the community, and, and there's a number of different images that God gives us to describe that that really help us understand what we're supposed to be, what God is calling us to be, and how as we're sitting here tonight and part of something that we should relate to one another based upon some of these images. For example, uh, there's, uh, in the, there's a passage that talks about, you know, the Apostle Paul says the church is basically a temple where God comes to dwell but not a temple made with, um, you know, bricks, but a, a temple made of people, of us. That in the midst of us, as we gather together in his name, he's in the midst of us. And as we praise him and we look to him and we make him the center of everything we do, he shows up in these incredible, uh, marvelous ways. There's a, a passage that kind of describes the church as a bride, and you can kind of break that down into, well, what does that mean for us? Because because God uh, or Jesus is, is the groom and, and we are the bride. And, and so how we should be relating to God and relating to one another, it tells us a, a lot about that through this, this image. And my hope is to get into some of these in, in weeks to come. He also breaks down, the Apostle Paul, that the church is a body with many members. And right, many of you have read these passages where it talks about how can the, you know, I say that it doesn't need a foot or whatever, right? That we are all members of one body. And that helps us relate to one another and relate uh, to God. But tonight, I want to just spend a few minutes uh, talking about the image of a family, that the church is a family. And uh, this is tough for some people to swallow. It really is, because a lot of Many people in here, all of us have had some type of dysfunctional family, all right? I can tell you that my family is extremely dysfunctional. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> I'm married into dysfunction. No, I'm just... My life was wonderful until... No. Uh, but seriously... Many of us have a lot of poor experiences in family. We can look to our families and say, I want nothing to do with the family. In fact, the whole idea of you talking about the church as a family gives me, it's like a trigger. But even in, it, or, or we talk about God being our father. Many of us have uh, relationships with our father that we'd rather completely forget about. But even in that negative connotation of that word of, of a family, because of sin in the world, uh, a lot of our negative experiences actually give us uh, a better picture of what it should have been. Like we know that our, maybe our, our, our biological family was wrong because we know what it could have been or should have been. 
You see what I'm saying? And so God gives us a picture of the church being a family in a very productive way, in a way that actually every family was supposed to be. Now, of course, we never live up to that, but it does tell us uh, a lot about how we should be interacting with one another and how God works, works through us in the midst of us understanding that we're a family. So in Ephesians chapter 2.19, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. A church is a family. And, and there's all kinds of ways that we can go, oh, okay, if it's a family, then it's, that means it's not a number of things. One of the things, if it's a family, you know, a family is not a business. So if um, most, a lot of people get frustrated in church because they're not relating to it as a family, and then instead they're beginning to relate to it uh, like, like it's a business. So, like, if I go into a restaurant and I sit there, you know, for like 15 minutes. Let's say I go into a restaurant, I'm sitting there for 15 minutes, and nobody comes up to me and, and uh, asks me, you know, if I want water or where's my silverware or how they can, they can serve me. Um, I'm, I'm like, you know what? I'm not coming back here. I, I, don't, even, I don't even like it here. Now... What if I were to try that at home <laughs> at, with the family? And I sat down at the dinner table, and I started going, Lady, it's been 15 minutes, right? I don't know if I'm going to come back. <laughs> She'd be like, you can hit the bricks right now. And uh, pop your clutch, kick rocks, all that, do what you got to do. But I'm not, this isn't a restaurant for you. This isn't a business you walked into. This is a family. And I'm not here to just uh, take care of you, right? But if I have that idea, if I walk into my household thinking that that's how everybody's supposed to relate to me and I'm supposed to relate to them in that way, like it's a business, then I'm going to be set up for failure. It's always going to let me down. I'm always going to be wondering why, why people aren't serving me the way that I, I think they should. So you have to realize that it's a family. There's a whole lot of things that we can say that do happen in the family. One is you're loved in a family. You're loved. But it's not just any kind of love. So uh, in the book of Romans, Paul says in, in chapter 12, he says, love one another, it says, with brotherly affection. So what does that mean? Well, brotherly affection, it's a familial, it's a family love. It means it's, like, it's this natural, deep uh, bond that binds you together. It's, it's, it's like a mother's love for a child. It's a family love. It's not, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis says something like, you know, a lover, you know, two lovers that come together, they'll say, oh, we are made for each other. We have this chemistry, you know, things are just clicking, we're just mates, we're soulmates, we're fit for one another, all these other things. Brotherly affection is like literally the opposite of that. It's like, I remember I talked about last week, we, you can look around, if we keep it real, you'd be like, man, there's a lot of people in here that I, I just wouldn't be thinking I'd be hanging out with. But here we are, sitting with one another. And so brotherly love, it's like a, between a brother, and it's the type of love that between a, like a, my brother. Nobody's allowed to beat up my brother, but me. <laughs> you know, maybe you had a brother, maybe you had a sister or whatever. You were allowed to beat up, but nobody else was allowed to. Because you had this deep, natural bond with one. You had a love for one another, hopefully, right, that kind of trumped everything else. It kind of superseded everything else. But it is something, but, but a brother and a sister, they're not friends, so to speak. You get it? I mean, a lot of times, uh, I can remember saying to my sister, you know, I don't even know who you are. You know, I can't, I don't even, I can remember her saying, he's not, he's not 
related to me. You know, she, she, she didn't want to think that she could possibly be related to me. Um, it's like the love that's between a dog and a cat living in the same house. Completely different, but something connecting. C.S. Lewis goes on to say that it's actually through two people who are comically different from one another with a bond of love that actually causes us to grow and cause, causes something deeper than you could ever have produced in your life by only loving or only hanging around those people which you feel this chemistry with. It's like, have you ever seen those... Uh, what do they call them? It's, this is like what I, I think marriage is like. You take those, those a rock tumbler. You guys know what a rock tumbler is? I mean, you take these jagged rocks and then and you put them in a tumbler and you spin it. And you, and you make it tumble and it's and it just hitting one another and crushing one another. And then you do it for a while and then you take it out and they're shiny and beautiful. It actually turns them into something that they couldn't be unless they were tumbling around with, with other rocks. And that's, that's why I think marriage is like that. Because God takes two people who are so opposite in so many different ways and says, let me see what happens when I throw these two together. And then put them through a tumbler, and let me see what that produces. I mean, that's a, that's a microcosm of really what it's like to be in a church. In fact, we get into, at some point we'll get into church membership and all these different things. And really we call, a church membership is really a membership covenant, which is similar to a marriage covenant. You're making commitments with people that like, are very different from you. But it's in the midst of that that your life is deepened. All right, so you're, you can be loved in a family. Loved in a way that it actually causes you, it deepens your life. But you're also known in a family. So you notice that in a, uh, you may know a lot about me, but unless you're living with me, uh, there's a lot that you don't know. Or, or you take a brother and a sister. I mean, you can hi- I can hide a lot of things from you. You can hide a lot of things from me. I, I'm not, I don't have that same ability to hide a lot of those things from Amber or my kids. They see it. They see me at my lowest. They see me at my highest. They see me when I'm stressed. They see me when I'm tired. They see me when I'm awake. They see me at all times. And so, but the great thing about that is this. I think at the, at the very heart of who we are, our greatest fear is to truly be known. That, that's really at the very heart of what it means to be uh, born in sin. We have a fear of rejection. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God. They were, they were rejected. They, they, they were banished from God's presence. And they were, for the first time, felt shame. Because they saw themselves. They, were, they realized They were fully known. And so what did they do? They began to cover themselves. And that's the story of every single person in here's life. Is that we were afraid to truly be known. Because if we were really truly known, we were afraid we wouldn't be loved. So what do we do? We act like we're known, but we cover ourselves. And we hide ourselves. Because the fear of rejection is deep. It runs deep. And, but you want to know what's amazing? One of the most freeing things, for as many of you can, can testify to, is when this thing that you've been hiding for so long in your life, when you actually get the courage to share that with somebody else, and you're not met with rejection, but you're met with grace, and you're met with love, and understanding, and forgiveness, and reconciliation, that is one of the most freeing things that you can ever experience in your life. It's, it, it, this bond, you begin to realize this bondage that I've been living under, if people really knew that I'm this cosmic imposter. And when you say, you know what, I, I, I'm just... You don't want to share this with me. And somebody says, 
I do that same thing. And all this time I've been living like I'm alone and I'm the only one who feels this. Man, in a church family, when you can be, you can be fully loved because it's in a church family that God calls us to be fully known. And because you know that somebody knows you, you know that their love for you runs deeper than what you're hiding behind. You follow me? That's, in a family, that's why a family love is called to, is, is something that's deeper. Because, man, I can hide it from you, but I can't hide it from them. And so you're, we are called to, to do life together. And if we begin to live like a family with brotherly love, recognizing I'm not just going to love the people I like, Right? I mean, that's really not love, actually. If I, if I only love the people I like, it's like, it's like the freedom of speech. It's, the freedom of speech isn't just designed to allow people to say what you like. It's actually designed, inherently, the freedom of speech is so that somebody can say something you don't like, and they have the freedom to do it. You see what I'm saying? In, in the love that God calls us to, like Jesus said, what, what good is it if I just love those who love me? Love your enemies. Now that is difficult. And when we start to love that way, man, you know what? All of the performing and the auditioning and the hiding, man, you know what it turns into? It turns into this, this safe place. It turns into a safe place where broken people are allowed to be broken. People are at work all day, they're auditioning, they're putting on a performance, they're, they're trying to earn and you know, be better and try to make it to the top. Man, shouldn't there be this haven where somebody can come and, and say, I'm allowed to be broken here. I'm allowed to be broken, to be known I'm broken, and still be accepted. Now that is something that I want to be part of. I'm, I, I, I don't want to be part of a, of a country club. I don't want to be part of a country club. Um, in a family, you're forced to deal with your dysfunction and your problems, your disagreements. I mean, when you're growing up and you're in a family, like you want to bolt and many of us have, over the years, tried to bolt, and then we just end up going, getting hungry and going back home, <laughs> realizing I couldn't live out in, up in this tree forever. Right? So you're just sort of forced to deal with your disagreement. I did that one time. I said, I'm running away, and I'm out of here. And I ran out, and they didn't know where I was, and I was up in a tree. <laughs> and then I got hungry, literally. I was like, man, I can't do it anymore. I think I'm going to go back. <laughs> A church, is, a church is not a country club. A church is more like, I think of it, you guys ever, uh, I can remember as a kid getting in, uh, you know, the big uh, tank of a car that we had back in the early 80s and driving to, down to Disney World. And all that happened in the midst of that vehicle, that station wagon on the way to Disney World was it was just a mess. And there were fights, arguments, irritations, all you, you fill in the blank that was on there. But we were together. And we were a family. We were going together and we knew where we were going. We were going to Disney World. We we're going to a better place. <laughs> but it's it's not gonna be just this grand experience all the time on the way to Disney World. It's it's going, to, it's going to be hard at times. You know, and God calls us together as brothers and sisters in Christ on our way to the promised land. And on the way there, it's not going to be this perfect ride all the time. But we're called to something greater. And through that process, through that tumbler, we become deeper. And we actually belong to something. In a family, you're, you're protected. You're not alone in the world. Many of you know what it's like to not be part of a family. To not have a place where you feel protected. Protected from other people. 
You know, all of us need protection from ourselves. You know that? I tell you what, there is nothing you can do to me that is probably worse than what I've done to myself. Can anybody testify? Anybody else in here? Am I alone in that? I'll tell you what. If you did to me what I've done to myself, I'd kill you. I mean, quite honestly. I probably shouldn't say that up here. But I wouldn't let anybody else get away with that. I mean, I need help. I don't need somebody to, to judge me. I need somebody to help me. Help me be what God has called me to be. And all of us need that. Unfortunately, many people, many of us have been part of, uh, participated in religious dysfunction, right? And that's why we have to keep coming back to Jesus, because we're all on that path where it turns into a self-righteous endeavor, this whole community thing, where people are gossiping about one another, talking about one another, judging one another, right, ganging up on one another. The, the only cure for that is, is Jesus. That's the cure for it. Recognizing that there is no superiority, there is no inferiority between any of us. It's only Christ that is, is superior. And He trumps everything. And it's the same forgiveness that He... Now, I'm not saying that happens overnight. God calls me to forgive somebody, and I quite honestly often think, I don't know how I can do that, Lord. I don't want to do it. Let's start there. I don't even want to do it. I'll tell you what I want. You know, I come up with a whole list of things I want to do. But the only cure for that that I know of is, is getting closer to the cross and recognizing again, all right, Lord, tell me again what it is that you did for me. How can I possibly hold this against somebody else when I've done these very same things and you forgave me? So we're, we're protected from ourselves, from others, from the devil. And it's in the midst of that that it becomes a safe place. Let me finish up with this. Not, not only do all those things happen in a family, but you grow in a family. All right. So in Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, uh, verse 11, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the uh, work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may be no longer, we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. Grow up. Say it with me. Grow up. Grow up already. <laughs> in every way into Him who is the head uh, into Christ. Families bring maturity. That, I'll tell you what. Uh, if there is one thing. That, that, honestly, I have friends um, who were only ch children, right? And that is a struggle. Because... Nah, I probably won't go there. I'm going to offend somebody if I go that route. I'll go this way. Uh, you know, having a brother and a sister, I learned that uh, the world wasn't all about me. Even when I wanted it to, and I thought I was the most important thing in the world, and I wanted what I wanted, I found out that there were other people that needed to be nourished too. And other people who needed attention. And, and so it wasn't all about me. And, and what we're told in the Scripture here is that all of us are born again into a family. That's really what it means to be born again. Every child that is born is born of somebody. And they're born into a family. But that every baby that's born is born immature. And they have to grow. So, so there's a couple of things that we can pull right from that right away. First of all, expect immaturity. You can just expect that. If you... If, if you're in a family and there's a new baby on board, uh, you know, you don't expect that person to be, you know, doing math in two months, right? You, you don't expect them to be knowing it all or, or caring for themselves within the first six months of their life or year. 
it's something that happens over time and it's a, it's, it's a process. But at the same time, we have to recognize maybe I need some maturing. Maybe I'm one of the babies. Because <laughs> we all are babies to some degree, right? Um, so a baby is alive, but a baby should be growing. And if a baby isn't growing, if, one of, if you had a sister or a brother and they were born and then like, you know, five years down the road or three years or three, six months, and you look and you're like, man, that's still the same size. They're not growing. Wouldn't you start to get concerned? I mean, because you'd be thinking they should be growing. I mean, we need to have a conversation about the fact that our six-year-old baby, you know, hasn't grown. I mean, that would be crazy. But so we can expect it like, hey, Babies need to grow. Babies should grow. Babies are, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why. Because it's, it says right here, babies, they're not discerning. A baby doesn't have wisdom. You know, if you, you could, uh, if a baby, you give, baby, uh, give a, a, a newborn poison, it'll gobble it right up. Right? It can't discern what's good and what's not. It, it, it just, pull, it, it, it's, its most innate desires are just want to be filled. And it's not discerning on whether it would be good or bad to be doing that. So when we're born again as, as children into God's family, we need to recognize I, I need to grow in my discernment of what's right and wrong. Maybe there's a lot of things that I've always thought were the right way of doing life or the right way of relating to people, or the right way to handle problems. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I need to grow in discernment. Babies are self-centered, right? Baby, they cry, they moan, they want what they want when they want it. And it's all about them. They're not going, oh, go ahead, you know, take care of brother first. <laughs> you know. Count others more significant than myself. That's right. Go ahead, Mom. You know, they're like, now. And, you know, so that's the nature of the baby. But we're to grow beyond that. To recognize, you know what? I'm self-centered. You know, I do love other people, but I love me a lot. And I talk about me a lot, right? Those are all things. Babies are tossed to and fro all over the place. It says right there. Um, no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. I mean, today I'm happy and everything's great, and the next thing you know, woe is me. You know, something doesn't work. It's just this constant. If you're on this constant roller coaster all the time, maybe there's some maturing that, that needs to happen. But it's in the midst of a family that nourishment happens. That we should be nourished in a family. We should be uh, nourishing one another, helping one another, helping feed one another uh, God's Word. And so that's, quite honestly, that, that's a concern as to why if I sat down at the, at the dinner table and my kids aren't there, I'd wonder where my... I mean, if, if Amber and I sit down and, and my daughter and my son aren't there, I'd say, where are they? I would, I, you know, they may have a, a reason why they're not there, but what is it? I do know that my kids need to eat. And so it's important that we're feeding on, on God's Word, or else you can't really nourish in Christ without His Word. You see what I'm saying? And so it's important that we do that within uh, the, the midst uh, of a family. So, you know, wh one of the most important things... To, for us to recognize as, as we look at nourishment and growth and maturity is, is to, to realize this. God called you, is calling you to be, calling me, calling all of us, to be a well, not a bucket. All right? Now think about that for a minute. He's not calling you to just come in here and get filled up. Maturity in Christ, uh, in the family, parents, the goal of parents, listen, there's another way to say this. The goal of a parent is not to have children. The goal of a parent is to have parents. 
You hear what I'm saying? I know that I can speak for him in the sense that, so th this is truth. So years ago, when Amber and I were first married, uh, you know, I was like, I don't know if, if and when I really want to have kids, you know, we're just married, you know, we're going to go on some vacation and stuff. And I'll tell you what, I promise you, it was every message that he got up here and preached. He'd talk about his only grandchild being a dog. And <laughs> I'd look over at Amber and be like, what's up with this? Like, I felt conviction every week. It was, my, what's my point? I, I can laugh about that now. But his goal wasn't just to have daughters. It was to have grandkids. And that brought more joy to him probably than his own kids ever. They, you're right. I mean, you hear grandparents talk about that. That, oh man, they thought the greatest joy was their children. But it was the grandchildren that brought an incredible amount of more joy. Right? And so why do I say that? Well, because God isn't calling you to, just, to be a disciple is to make disciples. So if you see church as just this place where you're here to get filled up, to be fed all the time, then you're, you're relating to it wrong. You and I are called to, to water other people as well. And it's in as much. Now watch. You want to know what one of the things that keeps me in the Scripture more than anything is teaching you the Scripture. It's, it's, it's like God's got it set up that way. You can't get around it. If you are really attempting to share the gospel with other people, it forces you into the gospel itself. It, it, it's, it's built in. You can't trick around it. And so nourishment in your own life is going to is going to begin, the growth will begin to happen in as much as you recognize I am called to share with other people what God has freely given to me. And I'm not just here to fill up my bucket. I'm here to be a well so that other people can drink. You see? That, so, you know, God calls us with gifts and he calls us to be members of, of a family. And, and that means we're not just relying on somebody else. We're not relying on ushers or greeters all the time. Not that we have any. Uh, we're going to have some, and you're all going to have an opportunity to become an usher and a greeter. But, but, but you know what? We should all be ushers and greeters. Amen. We shouldn't be going, you know, they really should have greeters at the door. <laughs> well, if we were a church full of greeters, there would be a whole bunch of people at the door greeting. You see what I'm saying? No, I got, I got to land this plane here. So how do you become part of God's family? It's, it's, you belong by believing. You belong uh, by believing. And you, you know, Jesus Christ and Him coming to earth was the greatest act of hospitality uh, that the world has ever seen. See, we will be filled with brotherly love. We will be filled uh, with, with the love of a family in as much as we recognize that we were once strangers. We were once aliens and lost. That's what the Apostle Paul told us in that verse. But now you have been drawn near and you've become members of the household of God. And you know how that happened? It wasn't because you earned your way to it. You know, pe people don't... Uh, uh, they don't earn their way into a family. You're part of a family. You, you, you're part of it. That goes back to that gang again. You don't go to family. You're part of a family. You're born into it. And we are born into a family through faith. We're born into God's family through faith. Why? Because Jesus, who, who was at the very heart of the family of God, came down to earth and was treated as a stranger, treated as an alien, treated as somebody lost, treated as a thief, treated in, uh, horribly mocked, beaten, spit upon, treated the worst. Why? So that we could be brought into the family. Jesus, who, who was at the very center of it, was willing to give all of that up so that we could be brought in. 
And it's in as much as you and I believe in our heart that, you know what? Jesus Christ did that for me. He was treated, even though he did not deserve it, he was treated as a stranger. He, was, he became unacceptable in the sight of God so that I could become accepted. It's as that becomes the very heart and center of our community that we really begin to live uh, like a family. Because it, it, the, the passage in Hebrews tells us that he's not ashamed to call you a brother. He's not ashamed to call you a sibling. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, if I honestly look at, I, I'm talking my life peeled back in ways that you do have no idea, in ways that I have uh, forgotten but God sees in my life how unacceptable I truly am, but yet he loves me and he cares for me and he protects me. He's there for me. He, he, he looks out for me. He, he, he never gives up on me. Oh man, I'll tell you what, that, that is the love that I desperately need. It's the love that you need and it's the love that God provides through us through other people in the family of God, in his church. So as Jesus is the very center of that, and we believe in him and what he did for us, we're able to do that for other people. Even the people in here that you're like, man, I, I have no idea who they are. I don't know, you know, they don't look my type. But you love them anyway. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being here with us tonight. And God, thank you for giving us a family because of the great work that Jesus has done for us on the tree of the cross. Father, I ask uh, for the faith to look to you and to be filled with your spirit, God, in a way that would continue to reveal to our hearts and reveal to our minds um, the great work that you did do for us uh, on the cross when you became a stranger and an alien and an outcast so that we could be accepted, God. We, we ask that you reveal that to us more and more so that we can go to the outcast, the unacceptable, the broken and the lost, God, and lead them to feel accepted and valued and significant and worth uh, what you see them worthy as, God. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us give thanks. Oh, Lord, we thank you that the Son of God became a man so that men could be the sons of God. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son to remove the sin that separated us from you, that we could be back in a right relationship, that we could be born again into a, a new family. Help us to, to love one another. Help us to be kind and patient. Help us to grow in brotherly love, as difficult as that can be. You've brought us all from various walks of life, and help us, help us to to be patient and and kind and loving, to be cheerful and to greet one another. Help us to feel like we belong. We pray that love would conquer all, and it's in Christ's name I pray, Amen. amen.